Take two. <laughs> as soon as we're on. So apparently it's already running, the stream. So we'll go ahead and talk to our audience. This is Alex. Alex is a medical student from the California North State University College of Medicine in Elk Grove, California. She has come to the Auburn Medical Group to do her family medicine rotation of her third year of medical school. Welcome, Alex. Thank you so much. It's been so lovely to be here. We have really enjoyed having you here. We've had a number of students. In fact, a number of students have been on the show. We had um, Gian was on once, and who else did we have? We had, um, uh, I want to say Cheryl, but it's not Cheryl. Chelsea? Chelsea, who did that tumor removal. Yeah. And didn't even know that's what it was while we were doing it. Uh, until the pathology came back. You can see that video. Uh, she did an excellent job. And you've been doing procedures also. Yes, great yeah. earwax removal procedure. We're trying to get it to 10 million views, so you guys <laughs> have to check that one out. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't been put up yet, but oh. so. good. Wait, wait to promote soon. Your, your video there. Very good. <laughs> we'll keep you around for that. So you enjoyed the earwax removal? Yeah, it was very satisfying. <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah. And then what other procedures have you done? Oh gosh, um, shoulder injections. So a cortisone shot for yes. a shoulder? Um, not necessarily a procedure, but a full um, woman's gynecolo gynecological annual exam. Um, I have done, gosh, procedures. I feel Lots of done... the cryotherapy with the... Oh yes, lots of the cryotherapy and even a shave biopsy yes. of, a, of a suspicious skin lesion. Very good. All right. Yeah. And we do like to get the message out that this Auburn Medical Group has become a teaching institution with this partnership with California North. So you've got the little emblem there on your on your uh, jacket there. Wearing the, the short white coat, the medical student lab coat, yes. which, of course, I, I had to do that for my two years of medical school. And I do remember there was this residency at one of the hospitals I worked at during my training where they would make some of the first year surgical residents or interns wear the short yeah, white coat. Like a hazing process. Yeah, well, well there's, <laughs> back when I went through, back when I sound so old, when I went through residency and medical school, there were so many, you could call them hazing practices mm. that, especially in surgery, they, they kind of had a, a, a old boys club back then. Uh, it, it was a different time and thankfully it's not the way it is now. We have a better situation. Mm. Uh, do you have any interest in surgery? I loved my surgery rotation you did. Okay. and I was surprised by that because it was probably the one specialty that I never considered, but I love procedures. Okay. So yeah. yeah and that, that's why I've loved getting to do so much here. And you've seen that. You've seen that family medicine is also a procedural yeah. or can be a procedural specialty. Yeah. There's quite a range. Family medicine can be a family doctor doing almost everything. Some of them will deliver babies. Uh, I don't know if it still happens, but when I was in training, on occasion, they would still perform appendectomies. Oh, yeah. Wow, okay. If you're in a rural area and there's not that many surgeons around. You have to do it. Yeah, not as much now, but it can be very procedural. Hmm. It's kind of tricky because you have to have malpractice insurance to cover the procedures you hmm. do, and they're really not real hip on covering uh, procedures that you don't do regularly. Hmm. So you kind of have to have some numbers to it. So you'll see this, this phenomenon in medicine of a, a specialist even. When they don't do a certain number of procedures, they'll, they'll just you know, let it go. Because, and not necessarily because it's not um, uh, money making. You know, they'll, they'll still have you know, a little bit of a loss financially to, to keep a well-rounded practice. But just because if you're not doing it regularly enough, you're not sharp enough at it. Yeah. And there's this whole malpractice thing where the company may not want to cover you if you only do one delivery every two years, you know, that, that sort of sense. thing. Yeah. Hmm. So third year at this school, where did you go to undergrad? UCLA. UCLA, very good. And yeah. we, uh, we actually figured out earlier that you had gone there with my son. Yeah, and I had probably seen him slacklining because I saw a lot yeah. of slackliners there. He was one of the slackliners. <laughs> on, on, let's see, where was it he would do it? It was. There was the dorms on the one hill on the west side, and then there was the uh, the hall and the library. Yes, I can picture what you're saying, but for some reason I'm blanking on the names you're as well. You're blanking on the name of the hall? I Royce know. Hall. Yeah, there and, was a Royce Hall. <laughs> and Powell Library. I didn't go to UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I should know, but there was a hill there. That's where we would all relax oh between classes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And then the, with the asymmetry of a hall, you know, the two sides are mm. different, like yes. 13 different differences or whatever. 
And uh, yeah, it was that hill as you go up to the library and Royce Hall yes. where That's he would do the slack line. Yeah. Not, not that you viewers would necessarily <laughs> interest me in the least, but yeah, I love that area. Mm. So uh, what was your bachelor's in? Your it was in sociology. And so I, I know. So well, at UCLA, what? it was organized um, with North Campus and South Campus. Yes. So North Campus were the more um, artsy majors and South Campus were all the science majors. Yeah. So I knew, you know, when I was 18 starting college that I wanted to be able to have classes in both. I wanted to be able to learn more than just uh, biology, chemistry, and physics. So I did pre-med and sociology. Wow, and you yeah. got into medical school. And I got in, <laughs> yes. When I was uh, getting into medical school, applying, there seemed to be this talk of uh, encouraging applicants to do something other than biology. And did you also have that encouragement to, hey, be well-rounded, have something that's interesting on your medical school application. Yeah. And so for you, it was sociology. Yeah. And, and even though they say that, still the number one um, bachelor major for getting into medical school is uh, either biochemistry or biology slash chemistry, like what um, Dr. Gwen did. Okay. Yeah. Still the number one. You actually one. have a better chance with chemistry than you do with biology of hmm. getting accepted. It's harder. But I think that it's very valuable, you know, just in my own medical school, medical school class, we have people from so many backgrounds. Some people have gone to business school, some people majored in fine arts. Um, and I think that aspect is very valuable. You have the oh, yeah. science major um, medical students, but then they're rubbing shoulders with medical students who had a totally different background. And then yeah. you have the best care and the best learning in that way. And, and for those who are watching, they may not know what it takes for a sociology major to get into medical school. You still had to take... Mm. Uh, engineering physics. You still had to take a year of organic chemistry. You still had to take a year of general chemistry before that organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. You still had to take uh, calculus. Yes. And you still had to take the MCAT, yes. which is over all of those. Yes. And you maybe even had to have some more upper division biology in addition to all that, I think, possibly, like anatomy uh, and physiology. Yes, yeah. So anybody who's getting into medical school with something other than a biological sciences degree, they're still taking that, too. Yes. And I want to share a fun fact. Um, fun so fact. I was a sociology major, and my year, I think it was the first year that the MCAT added in a psychology, sociology section. I got in the 100th percentile on that one. Very good. <laughs> because the other med students didn't take sociology classes, and so that was who I was competing against. So I was very proud. Oh, very good, Alex. <laughs> okay. So you have that little claim to fame there. Exactly. It, it, it probably was something that came up on your interviews, I would guess, at medical schools. Um, so th the interviews that I did were mm -hmm. many, they're called MMR. Um, so they're question based. You have seven rooms and seven different interviewers. Have you heard of this? No. Yeah. It's the new, um, interview format. I actually didn't have any, I had three interviews. I didn't have any, uh, medical school interviews where they had the traditional format. And so each room has a question that they ask. Um, and it could be, how would you approach this, uh, problem? problematic, difficult, challenging patient, or what do you propose for the future of healthcare? And you discuss that particular question. Okay. Yeah. I'm guessing that that's an effort to kind of um, standardize hmm. the process of evaluating the candidates compared to what they've done in the past. Yes. Yeah, so it's standardized and also it gets to more of um, your quality. So we even had some uh, some of those mini interviews, as they're called, where you had to role play and be a physician working with an actor patient, or we had some where you had to have um, a partner who's also interviewing, you're facing opposite walls, and you have to try to work together to build a puzzle without being able to visually see each other. So it was it was the psychology stuff where they were really trying to get at what kind of person you are. Wow. Mm. wow I never imagined they'd have that kind of stuff going on. Okay, good. Yeah. In medical school, your first two years were mostly classroom, didactics, labs, and now in your third year, you're out in hospitals and offices like ours. Is, yeah. is, is that right? Yes. Okay. So what have you done in your third year before coming to our family medicine outpatient setting? Um, so I had surgery, internal medicine, I did a neurology rotation, and then also psychiatry. Wow. Yes. Already? I think that's what do you have left in third year? Um, gynecology and pediatrics. And then, uh, listen, do they still do part two of your Yes. 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 Yes.
anything. Or if you start to think a little bit, what it is you got to do. Yeah. Are you already planning your schedule? Well, I am planning my schedule in the sense that I'm applying for electives, but I already knew before, you know, even entering my third year that I wanted to fill my fourth year uh, majority up with specific internal medicine uh, elective rotation. So I, I want to take a cardiology rotation, nephrology. I want to feel that I really have such an expert grasp on all of medicine and then just use the first few months to do um, specialized ro uh, elective rotations. But due to COVID, they're not allowing us to do too many rotations, which would be the typical um, way to organize it. Um, but yeah, so my school really emphasized that to us as well, that we want a diverse kind of fourth year education and then we can start specializing when we enter our internship, not necessarily in our fourth year. So. That is true. Yeah. And not, not every program is that way. Some of them mm. say, this is what you're gonna do. Go ahead and fill up your schedule with mm. you know, emergency medicine, in my case. Right, okay. oh, okay. Yeah, uh, but there's some varieties. Uh, a mission trip to Papua New Guinea and- You did that in fourth year? In fourth year, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I spent 30 days in Papua New Guinea in a missionary hospital doing tropical medicine. That's amazing. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. And then uh, because it was emergency medicine, I, I got a little bit more um, anesthesiology for experience with intubating. And, but I didn't need to because mm -hmm. I got all that in the residency anyways. True. So, yeah, I, I probably would have really benefited from getting more of a well-rounded exposure to other specialties. Though, right. you know. One thing I did do, though, was... Uh, include a little psychiatry because I knew I wasn't going to get a lot of that and I had an interest in it and yeah. I enjoyed working with it. So I did a rotation at the uh, Missouri State uh, Psych Hospital where they actually kept the people who were criminally insane. That's, that's interesting. That's where I did my psychiatry rotation at Napa State. So oh, you similar did? organization. Oh my goodness, yeah. yeah. yeah that, would be the, that would be California's version of what I did. Mm -hmm. So you did a rotation there too. As a third year student. As a third year, yes. Oh wow, interesting. Okay. So very different from yeah. my colleagues who did an outpatient psychiatry rotation. At, for example, like a Kaiser, it would have been a very, very different experience. Okay. Now, do you have friends who also had interest in the health sciences but haven't gotten in yet? To medical school. Medical school or PA school or um, some other program, or maybe they're considering PhD programs. Yeah, I mean, I'm 27, so a lot of my friends have already kind of went off on their paths, but I do have one friend who is going back to school to go into nursing, um, so that's exciting. But, but for the most part, I think that most people were faster than me when they were kind of deciding whether or not to go um, into medicine or not, so. Okay, so you're the one that took a little more time to do it. Yes, so I had two years after okay. UCLA. So after doing that, oh, what did you do for those two years? Um, so I lived in Vancouver for part of it. Um, that's where I met my husband. Oh, very good. Yeah. And I also um, traveled a little bit and I did some research and volunteering. Um, one of those was at BC Children's Hospital. I okay. haven't had the chance to tell you about this uh, oh. research project yet, but it's, go ahead. it was, oh, <laughs> there we go. zoom in on me. Yeah. Um, so it was working with uh, the mental health department at the BC Children's Hospital and they were researching a novel emotion-based, group-based parent and child therapy for children and adolescents with somatic symptom disorders. And it was very effective. Wait, the parents also had somatic symptoms? The parents also were involved in the therapy. And so every week was a, t was a two hour session with the first hour, um, the parents and children were all in the room. And the second hour was the parents and children separately each receiving therapy, um, group-based therapy and they found that it really worked for these families. And these were children who had been in and out of the emergency department over you know, 10, 15 times in the last several months or year. Uh, they all had a huge variety of symptoms. There was everything from functional seizures, so non-epileptic seizures, to not being able to swallow, to just uh, severe stomach aches. And most of these children had been able, had not been able to, but had been forced to skip uh, school or were currently being homeschooled. So they were refractory to everything else that had been tried. And this, um, but this program really made huge differences. And we did research, so we got to see the before and after. Um, we got to see the, the measurement effects, the actual quantitative data that showed that this was effective. Uh, and I'm really hoping that other medical centers who, ha who, are, who are county medical centers who 
handle the patients who have been already um, not able to be treated and helped from community-based programs, I hope that they will adopt this. So this what other uh, modalities was it compared against? Uh, CBT, okay. uh, medications. Um, there's no s specific first-line standardized preferred treatment for soma somatic symptom disorders. But those things it was compared against, it was found to be more effective at getting yes. patients able to have a life exactly. instead of thinking they have these symptoms. Yes. Or I guess they actually feel the symptoms or? Oh yes, the symptoms are very real. Um, no. Yes, it, well, for example, um, the, the non-epileptic seizures, you can see that there's a change in their brain activity, but it's not the change that you would expect to see from a normal seizure. So hmm. there is something physiologically going there on in their something. body, um, and the actual group itself was called the mind-body connection. So it truly is um, a psychiatric problem that expresses itself through the body. Yeah. It's really interesting. But you made, you made progress with this treatment. That's great. Yes. And I loved working with the, with the kids and the adolescents and, and the families um, all together. Do you think you might go into that field? Well, the, uh, that's the thing I loved. I've loved everything I've done and I feel <laughs> passionate about so many things. Um, so I was thinking child psych um, for a long time, but I, I don't know if I could give up all of medicine. I'm such a nerd and I love medicine so much. And, I, and I've shouted a child psychiatrist and I've, uh, I could see myself doing that, but there's, there's no medicine. The child also has uh, obesity, diabetes, um, all these other comorbidities, and your, your job is not to address those. And I just don't know if I could, if I could only work with psychiatric problems. I understand. Which it's is why I consider family medicine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm still very tempted um, by family medicine as well. Well, you can choose anything, hmm. but you would be excellent in family medicine. So Thank know, you. Know that that's there, and then the others, see if they work for you. Thank you for so saying that. What I want to ask you though is, at your place in, in your education and training, if you were to talk to somebody, who, says. Yeah, maybe medical school, maybe PA school, maybe nurse practitioner, maybe I'll do research, you know, in a PhD program. Do you have a piece of advice to give to them, given the experience you went through um, two years ago, or three, I guess now? Yeah, and I luckily had somebody like that in my life recently. Um, my mom's friend's daughter gave me a call um, oh, okay. because I offered. And I was so excited to be able to give her this advice. She's graduating high school. She's wanting to go into pre-med. Um, but she's hesitant because she's met burnt out physicians, burnt out people in the mm. medical field. And that was actually my experience. I uh, hesitated with the decision to go into medicine at all um, based on people I had met, based on my brother who at the time was either in late med school or early residency who was feeling a little bit of the stress. Um, and so I was really excited to be able to share with this um, high school senior that once you actually start working with medicine, once you get to meet inspiring doctors who actually love what they do, who love educating, who are still excited about what they're doing, um, it will totally be able to fulfill that part of you that's drawn to it. Because um, the people who are questioning if they should go into it, they have something inside that's telling them, oh, I wanna work with health, I wanna work with patients. and and they get scared away by the lifestyle or the, the debt or all these things yeah. that are very scary uh, decisions to make, but I could not be more fulfilled with my path and where I am. And, um, and I wish that I would not have hesitated so much to dive into it because I'm so happy where I am. You're talking about the mentors and the instructors. In your third year so far, uh, what has your experience been with the different um, attendings you've worked with? Uh, like I alluded to, they have all been, not 100% of them, but almost all of them have been so inspiring oh, okay. and so great to work with. Um, and my first rotation ever, you know, working in a hospital, working with patients was surgery. And of course I was terrified because you hear about um, the surgical preceptors and how they're very strict. But from then on, they just started me off on a great foot because they were supportive. They were um, great teachers. They were not uh, strict or overbearing in any way. 
and everybody has treated me like their little sidekick and made me feel so proud to be a future doctor. Um, and I feel so lucky that my school has this network of amazing preceptors like yourself and like Dr. Vaughn who have been just amazing. So I was wondering if that is something unique about your school because your school doesn't have its own hospital and so you kind of have to go in smaller groups to the places you go. For example, here you're the only medical student mm. right now. Uh, and I think that's the way it's, yeah, with all of them, it's only been one student at a time. Mm -hmm. So maybe you do kind of get in that kind of medical school uh, preceptors who are more likely to give you personal attention uh, compared to a school where they're being followed by a dozen medical residents and students and maybe a pharmacology student, or, you know, the whole thing, PA and nurse practitioner also. Uh, in this big, big group that mm -hmm. goes around. Have you been in that group, in one of the hospitals where it's... One, one of them, yes. Yeah, okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's most of what my experience was this mm. third year. Okay. Was as a part of a big team. And it wasn't always personal. <laughs> okay. Not always. So now yeah. let's take questions from our viewers. So you can, I'm sure there's people commenting and questioning and... I think they need to call me to get the... No? Yeah. Nothing, huh? We're just not that exciting for them, I guess. <laughs> we're answering all of their curiosities maybe that's a, maybe as that's we go. <laughs> we're, we're, we're just, yeah. Not, um, so there was something from Lindsay Antoine, I think, before we started. Wait, she said, just hanging around waiting. And that was before we got started because of <laughs> the not too uncommon lately. It's delay in the start. We'll try not to do that in the next one. But we do want to announce that at 4 o'clock today, we're going to have for our channel members and we'll also put the link out there on Patreon also. Uh, so those people who are really interested in the Auburn Medical Group channel, and enough that they're a member or a patron, that they can be a part of our didactic session that we're going to do for this week. We haven't picked the topic yet, unless you now know what you want to talk about. Um, I'll let you take the It's a family lead. medicine topic. Yes. We're going to pick something from the American Academy of Family Medicine Residency Curriculum Guideline, I believe is the way that's titled. You can actually find it online. We're just going to be reading off of the uh, one of those topics and commenting on it as we go. So it's not a, a super formal lecture. It's more of a conversation. We have dialogue. We, we've done it before. And we will allow you to be a part of it too. And you can even ask questions while we're going through. So again, if you're a channel member or Patreon, you'll be able to find uh, the link on Patreon. Or if you're a channel member, you can just, I guess you just have access to it because I'll open it up to channel members. And it probably won't be available after the fact. It'll probably just be during the live show that they'll be able to, to get a hold of it. Any comments or questions or? Nope. Okay. Uh, we're just listening to you. Yeah. Just, I need to see where Lindsay is. They're three hours ahead of us. She's off work. She's up work. Uh, sort, of, uh, sort of related to you. Not, <laughs> we, we wouldn't call it life sciences. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not as social media adept as you yeah. are. Um, I just have my personal Facebook um, that I use for messages mostly. And, and you like stalking on it or? <laughs> um, it's not for my fans, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, so. Believe me. But thank you so much for being on the show, and we will do this again. After.